You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Sometimes we as Christians can treat God like this. And what I mean by that is when we find ourselves in difficult situations, we want relief. We want comfort from sorrow. We want peace when there's chaos. And of course, that's very natural. I understand that. But when that happens so often, especially in a backslidden Christian's life, when there's difficulty, you know, all of a sudden they're being like, you know what, I think I will seek God. And all of a sudden when difficulty comes, man, they're reading their Bible like never before. Where's that verse? I knew there was a verse in here. And they're praying like they never prayed it before. Ooh, God, I need you, God, in my life. There is often a scenario in our lives that pushes us over the edge. Even though we appear to be self-sufficient, we seek help in any manner imaginable. Usually, your final resort in a trial is to seek God's assistance. When you have exhausted all other options, you tend to turn to God and plead for His help. Today, Pastor Ron explains how you can start to establish confidence in Jesus at every stage of your life. Instead of relying on worldly solutions, you can begin to put your faith in Jesus in all situations. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 6 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. Turn to the Gospel of John. And you're turning to chapter 6. We'll be picking up where we left off last time. Chapter 6, we'll be looking at verses 15 through 22. So the Gospel of John, we've entitled Identity because it's all about revealing the true identity of who Jesus is, that he is God. And so we're going to see that, of course, today as we move through here. Uh, Many years ago, a, a fishing fleet that went out from a small harbor on the east coast of Newfoundland went out early in the morning, however, by evening was supposed to return. They did not. Uh, A large storm had come, which, of course, is very common in those waters, and by evening, not a single vessel had returned. And so it was now in the early hours of the morning, and so you have wives, you had children in this small fishing village. Of course, that was their whole livelihood. They're on the shores all night long, and now early in the morning, praying, desperately praying that something would happen, that they would see their husbands returning in the fleet. To make matters worse, uh, one of the homes in the village actually had caught on fire. And because everybody's attention was there in the docks and on the shore, no one was there for the house, and the house completely burned down. After countless hours of prayer, the good news is, as just before the break of dawn, the fleet was actually returning to the harbor from this storm. It was very foggy and so forth. And of course, everybody was overjoyed and you had husbands and wives and families reunited there at at the shore. However, there was one woman who was very sad. And of course, she said to her husband, I'm glad you're back, but you know, bad news. I mean, our whole house burnt down to the ground. I am so, so sorry. He said to her, honey, don't worry. Thank God for the fire. And she was kind of puzzled. What do you mean? I mean, how could you say that? How could you even be taking it so well? He said, honey, it was our house that was on fire that led our whole fleet back into shore. Thank God for the fire. As human beings, we naturally repel from from fiery trials, from storms. We, We don't invite them into our life. And yet so often, God has a plan for them. And Peter said this in 1 Peter 4.12. He said, Brethren, Christians, don't think it's strange. In other words, don't be surprised concerning the trials in your life as though some strange thing happens to you. In other words, don't be thrown off because it's going to happen, but rather rejoice. And you say, how can you possibly rejoice? How could we as that husband say, hey, thank God for the fire. Thank God for the storm. Well, because ultimately God is with us. God is with us. And he always has a plan. And this is what we're going to see in these verses before us, in verses 15 through 21, as the disciples find themselves actually in a literal storm, struggling in this storm. And yet Jesus, as always, comes through, and he's going to teach them some lessons and, of course, some life lessons for us as well. So I've entitled our message, The Calm in the Storm. And uh, we're going to divide this passage into three movements. We see the departure, then the difficulty, and then the deliverance. Now we begin... With the departure in verse 15, and I want to spend some time here. There's a lot of things that we need to develop here. The first of which is very obvious here as we read. It says, therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, and we'll stop right there. In the earlier verses, Jesus had just fed 5,000 men, not including women and children. So possibly a crowd up to 20,000 people were miraculously fed food from the hand of God, from a little boy's lunch. We looked at that in detail. And so John now tells us that this very crowd wants to come and make Jesus king. 
Now, we can understand that because uh, the Jews had been suffering under the Roman dominance. They were, would be eager to anoint anyone king who could take them from the tyranny of Rome. And, of course, Jesus has all the credentials anyone could need. He speaks with authority. He fears no one. He heals the sick, and he feeds the multitudes, right? What couldn't Jesus do? But again, the concept of these people, as we're going to see, was purely secular, purely material. Jesus came, of course, bringing a spiritual kingdom. But the consensus, consensus of this people was essentially this. Let's, let's make Jesus king. And if he doesn't want to be king, hey, we're going, to, we're going to make him king. It says they were going to try and make him king by force. Now, of course, Jesus is omniscient. He knows all things. In fact, John chapter 2 and verse 24 tells us that Jesus knows what's in the heart of all men. And so it says in verse 15, when he perceived this, we're going to see that he departed. He departed. So Jesus knew what these people were thinking, but more so he knew their motive. They were looking for an earthly king, right? To take them from the tyranny of Rome. But Jesus came as a heavenly lamb to take away the tyranny of, of sin, Jesus did not come the first time to establish a kingdom on earth. He came the first time to redeem men of the curse that's on this earth because of our sin. So Jesus did not come to earth to be some kind of political potentate. He actually came to earth to be a servant savior, to lay down his life. In, in Matthew 20 and verse 28, Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, not to be some king, someone political. I came to, to serve and actually to give my life a ransom for many. So Jesus is going to depart from these people because he knows their hearts. In fact, they were what we would say not true seekers, but they were thrill seekers. The only reason why they're coming to Jesus here is because they meet or he meets their need. They saw Jesus, I would say, something like a, you know, a, a celestial or a divine genie. You know, he heals the sick. He raises the dead. He feeds the multitudes. Jesus for president, right? But what we're going to see at the end of chapter 6 is Jesus continues to explain to this crowd what it really means to crown him Lord in their life. It tells us that the majority of the people turn back and follow him no more. Jesus is nobody's genie. We either follow Jesus on his terms as God or we don't follow him. And this reminds me as I was reading that, this passage this week of 1 Samuel chapter 4. And you don't have to turn there, but it was a time in the uh, history of Israel in, in 1 Samuel chapter 4 where the Israelites were in battle against the Philistines. One of the enemies they fought many times. And they were being dominated by the Philistines. In fact, they were in battle, and it tells us they were losing the battle. And so it tells us in verse 3 that they said, let's go back to camp and get God. And you say, what do you mean go back to camp, get God? Well, they said it this way. Let's go back to camp and get the ark. See, they, they kind of reduced, because they weren't following God this time, they reduced God to just, well, he's in this ark, and this ark is powerful. And if we bring this ark to battle with us, God will be there, and we'll defeat our enemies. They reduced God down to some kind of genie in a box. And so they brought the ark out to battle, and God said, no, I don't dwell in a box, and I won't be treated that way. And so they were defeated by the Philistines, and the ark of the covenant was actually taken from them. And so this fickle crowd here is not interested in worshiping Jesus as God or repenting of their sins. They just simply want Jesus to do what they think is best, right? By the way, sometimes we as Christians can treat God like this. And what I mean by that is when we find ourselves in difficult situations, we want relief. We want comfort from sorrow. We want peace when there's chaos. And of course, that's very natural. I understand that. But when that happens so often, especially in a backslidden Christian's life, when there's difficulty, you know, all of a sudden they'll be like, you know what? I think I will seek God. And all of a sudden when difficulty comes, man, they're reading their Bible like never before. Where's that verse? I knew there was a verse in here. And they're praying like they never prayed it before. Oh, God, I need you, God, in my life. But then as soon as everything is good again, well, I don't have time for God, right? Or, you know, I love God. I like going to church as long as he doesn't put any demands on me. But as soon as I read some verse that tells me I can't be doing what I like doing, and someone comes to me and says, you know, as you're a Christian, you should be doing it. I don't like that. You know, some people get upset, and they just walk away from God. So they're treating God the same way, kind of like a genie. In other words, I like God as long as he does my thing when I want and how I want. But if he doesn't do it that way, I, you know, I'm not so sure. I want to follow him. There's an inconsistency. And so this crowd is set on crowning Jesus king, not because they love him, but because Jesus has something they want. He brings bread. He heals people, man. He, he could overthrow the Romans. Man, it'll be much better for us, that kind of thing. And so it says in verse 15, Jesus departed. Jesus departed. Now, 
It's interesting, if we read Matthew's account of this story, as well as Mark's account, we get a fuller picture. It tells us that before Jesus departed, he sent the crowd away. I mean, because we don't read of them in this passage anymore. So we understand Mark and Matthew say he, Jesus sent the crowd away. Now you say, that's a miracle. I just need you, maybe you wouldn't see that, but that's a miracle. Listen, it's not easy to send a mob of people of 20,000 that want to take you by force and make you their king. But it tells us that Jesus just sent them away. How do you account for that power of God? This is the same Jesus when a giant lynch mob in his own hometown of Nazareth wanted to take him and throw him off the cliff. It tells us Jesus passed through him. And so here in this passage, Jesus sends the crowd away and then he departs. By the way, we also read down in verse 17 that he sent his disciples to get into a boat by themselves. So the crowd is now sent away. It's in the evening. The 20,000 or how many it is are sent away. Jesus tells the disciples, you get in a boat and he departs. What does he do? The end of verse 15, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. He goes alone. But as we understand the story, we're gonna get to it. We know that Jesus sends his disciples into the storm. So this is a preordained test. Jesus is purposely gonna send his disciples into a storm and he's getting away by himself. Now, why is he getting away by himself? Matthew's account tells us. You might want to write that down. That's Matthew 14, 23. It tells us Jesus went on the mountain by himself alone and prayed. So now we know what he's doing as he's on the mountain alone. He's, he's praying. Now, again, I want to set the scene so we understand the brevity of this. Just think of Jesus as a man. Jesus has to be absolutely exhausted. He's been ministering all day, all morning, up into the night. He arrived at the shores of Bethsaida. He healed people all afternoon. And now it was getting near evening. The disciples said, Jesus, send the crowds away. It's late at night. Jesus has compassion on the crowd. He says, no, no, let's feed them. He feeds them. And then he continues healing the crowd. And it's only now as the sun's going down, he sends them away. He goes to the mountain. And what does he do? He prays. Now, is that what you would do? Just be honest with yourself. If you worked all day long, giving, 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 you know what we'd probably do when we get alone? Crash. Man, I need some R&R. I need some rest, right? But Jesus prayed. And I'm thinking, man, if Jesus prayed, how much more do I need to pray, right? I mean, he doesn't need to pray. I mean, he's God. But as the son of man, seeking to give us an example to follow, he prayed. Prayer is the Christian source of strength. Prayer is where we get our batteries recharged. And yet, isn't it honestly true when we have a long day, the first thing we want to do if we get home, maybe it's a long day at work or we've been out doing errands or whatever it is, when we get home and it's late, the first thing we want to do is just, man, just veg. Just want to do nothing. But maybe what we need to do is we need to go in the other room and we need to pray. We just need to pray. Or when we gather back together for married to our spouse, we just need to pray. Say, Lord, thank you for this day. Give us strength as we move on, you know. Thomas Brooke said this. He said, the best Christian is he that is the greatest monopolizer of time in private prayer. Wow. I know I need it in the morning, but I need it throughout the day too. And at the end of the day, we need to monopolize our time for prayer. In fact, John Bunyan said this. He said, prayer is a shield to the soul. It's a sacrifice to God and it's a scourge to Satan. Oh, that's a good word. Because Satan's after you all day long. And so you got to be prayed up. We need to pray. And so this is what Jesus is doing. It's the end of a long day, and now he's going to prayer. But what, what is he doing in prayer? Well, I think he's doing what he always did. He's interceding. We call it intercessory prayer. But what does that mean? It just means he's praying for other people. We know that because that's what Jesus did all the time. All the time. For example, when we get to John chapter 17, he's praying for his disciples, and he's also praying for us. In Luke chapter 22, knowing that Peter would fall, he says, Peter, I know you're going to fail me, but I'm praying for you. In Matthew 11, 25, he's praying again, interceding for his disciples. We see him praying for others at the tomb of Lazarus who had lost a loved one. And then when Jesus is on the cross... He actually prays for the very people that put him there. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So Jesus was ever and always interceding for others. So guess what he's doing right now? Right now. He's interceding. He's praying. 
It tells us that in Romans 8, 34. It says he's right now at the right hand of God interceding for us. In fact, Hebrews 7, 25 says he ever lives or he's always making intercession for us. So that's what Jesus is doing. So get this picture in mind. As the narrative unfolds, Jesus is sending the disciples into a boat to purposely be in a storm. And guess where he's at? He's on the hillside, on the mountainside, praying for them. So we need to get that picture in our own minds. Because the next time you find yourself in a storm, by the way, notice I say the next time. It's not if, it's when. In fact, some of you are in storms right now. Some of you are coming out of it and some of you are about to go into one. Because we're going to experience storms in life. So the next time you find yourself in one or in one, keep this picture in mind. As the disciples are in the storm, Jesus is praying for them. And that's, that's, that's comforting. That's faith building. Now, understand this as well. And this is, again, all backdrop to understand how many you know, layers there are to this story. First of all, we know that that first miracle of feeding the thousands was public for so many. This next miracle he has, he's going to walk on the water to the disciples, is a private one. It's meant for them. Now, of course, we learn it, too, through the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. But there was a purpose in it. It was a purposeful miracle for confirming the disciples' affections. You say, what do you mean? Well, understand this. The disciples saw what the crowd was trying to do to Jesus. They're with Jesus. Jesus is going to send him in the boat, but not before this crowd wants to make Jesus king. And what does Jesus do when they say, we want to make you king? Jesus turns it down. He says, I'll have none of that. Go, I'll have none of that. So as the disciples are getting into the boat and they're rowing to the other side, they're probably thinking, have we misplaced our affections? I mean, isn't this what we follow Jesus for? Isn't this why we're following in the first place, that he would be king? So maybe we have misplaced our affections. Maybe we've put our faith in the wrong person. But Jesus is going to answer that question, and he's going to strengthen their faith as he comes to them in the midst of the storm and says, no, you got the right one. I'm the king of kings, Lord of lords. I walk on water. I'm the Lord God. So that's the departure and really the backdrop to this story because now we move to the difficulty. Verse 16, now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Now, one thing I need to point out here is this word evening. <clears throat> it means it's actually translated from first watch. The Jews would divide their evenings, as did many ancient cultures. They divide their evenings and their days into four watches. So the evening watch is divided into four watch. The first watch is 6 to 9 p.m. The second watch, 9 p.m. to 12 p.m. The third watch, uh, 12 midnight to 3 a.m. And the fourth watch, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So just keep that in mind. It'll come in handy later. But it does right here. This is the first watch. So somewhere between 6 and 9 p.m., evening had come. He had sent the crowds away after feeding the 5,000. He sends his disciples into the boat. They go into the boat. And they went into the boat and went over to the sea towards Capernaum. They're in Bethsaida, so they're crossing to the other side. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. So Jesus didn't come. In fact, he told them, get over and cross to the other side. So they were just being obedient to the Lord. We know that Jesus goes to the hillside, the crowd's gone, and they're in the boat alone. Verse 18 says, and then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. Now understand this, from Bethsaida, where they were, the area, to Capernaum is only about a six-mile stretch of water. That's it. And we also know that the disciples are halfway towards their destination, verse 19, before this hits. Because it says, so when they had rowed about three or four miles. So they're halfway to their destination. And by the way, the disciples are exhausted as well. Keep in mind, their day began back in verse 1 of chapter 6. When they had been ministering halfway throughout the day. And Jesus said, let's go to the other side of Bethsaida and have a little rest. So they were intending to have some rest with Jesus when they got to the other side. But then you remember the whole crowd joined Jesus. Jesus has compassion. He heals their sick. He teaches them. Then it's the end of the evening. He says, let's feed them. And so the disciples thought they were going to get rest. They've been going all day long as well. But now it's evening, and they're going to just row to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is just a giant lake. And then finally, they'll, they'll get some rest, right? However, they only get halfway, and there's a strong wind. 
Mark's account tells us that there was a tempest, a large storm, and they were straining at the oars. So here we got 12 men. They're straining at the oars because it's a large storm. We say, well, how is that possible? Well, because the Sea of Galilee, and we've, I've been there many times. Some of you have gone on our trips to Israel. But the Sea of Galilee rests 650 feet below sea level. Below sea level. You know, the Gulf is sea level. And when you have that, it gets warmer waters, warmer temperature. It sits in actually in a basin. Now, to the north, you have a large mountain range that stretches all the way to Lebanon. You have Mount Hermon. This is 9,000 feet high. And these ravines that pass and dip down into the Jordan Valley. So when you have a northerly wind coming and crossing over the mountains, and they're snow-capped, by the way, it's very cold, and then they dip down into this lower basin of the Galilee, it creates these fierce storms. That's exactly what we get, of course, here all the time, right? When the northerly winds come and they hit the warm uh, gulf temperature, boom, it clashes. And that's what happens here quite often. In fact, this is not the first storm that they've been involved with. There was one earlier, remember, that Jesus was with his disciples. And they're not uncommon today. In fact, you can have waves commonly six uh, feet high, and there's been some recorded nine on a large lake, the Sea of Galilee. Pretty amazing. So the disciples are now halfway towards their destination, and this storm hits. They're straining at the oars to make headway. Now, again, did Jesus know there would be a storm? Absolutely. Listen, here's the point. Jesus sent them right into it. So let's talk about this for a moment. First of all, we need to note the fact that when Jesus told his disciples to get into the boat, they didn't question him. I think that's pretty amazing. They didn't say, well, Lord, how come we have to get in the boat? You're not going with us. Why do we have to get in the boat? Or maybe we'll wait for you, then we'll get in the boat. Or why do we have to go over? What are we going to do? How long is it going to take? What are we doing after that? I mean, they, had, they could have had all kinds of questions. None of the gospel accounts give us any of that. It just tells us Jesus said, get in the boat and go to the other side, and they did it. No questions. They simply obeyed the Lord. They had no further understanding of the situation. And so they were obedient. And listen, that's the hallmark of a true disciple, right? Unquestioning obedience. Yes, Lord. Right? Yes, Lord. I mean, sometimes we say no. You know, the word no and Lord should never be in the same sentence. That's incongruent. If he's Lord, the word no doesn't even exist, right? It should always be yes, Lord. So they get into the boat. Jesus asked them to, they did it. So are the disciples, here's the question, are the disciples in the will of God? Of course they are. Are the disciples doing everything Jesus asked them to do? Yes, to the T. However, notice where their obedience gets them. Right smack dab in a storm. And here we learn a very important spiritual lesson. Obedience does not relinquish trials in the life of the believer. Sometimes it takes us right into them. Right into them. You say, but wait a second, Lord, I thought that if I followed you, it would always be smooth waters. Yeah, and then you woke up, right? Pop, there goes the bubble. Not so. And listen, Psalm 34 and verse 19 says this, many, not few, not some, but many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. That's good news. Or how about John 16, Jesus said, in this world you will, not you might, but you will have tribulation. But be of good joy because I've overcome the world. I got a plan in it. But listen, obedience does not relinquish rough waters. In fact, sometimes it sends us right into it. So this story here then eliminates the fallacy that if I just follow Jesus, if I just make sure I'm in the will of God, life will be a slice of pie, never any rough waters. Oh, it's going to be awesome. Warm fuzzies, you know. No. Listen, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, your problems may just be beginning. And what I mean by that is God has to deal with some things in your life, you know. Oh, we've got some. I got to get the rough sandpaper for this one. Gabriel, some of that rough sandpaper. I got to work on Ron. He got a lot of stuff that's got to come off, you know. That's, that's the way it is. So Christ is with us. He'll be with you. It'll be an amazing ride. What a journey. But get ready. There are going to be some fireworks, you know. So right off the bat... Being in God's will does not eliminate trials. Sometimes it puts us into it. I think the classic example is the three Jewish teenagers we read about in the book of Daniel. Thanks for joining us here today on Larger Than Life as we go through the Gospel of John. Gospel means good news, and the good news that John shares is summed up in the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's good news indeed. Today's teaching from Pastor Ron Hint and others like it can be found on our mobile app, so go to ltlradio.org to find the link. Larger Than Life is also available in podcast format, so please subscribe if you want to stay connected and immersed in our teachings. In case you've forgotten, that website again is ltlradio.org. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint in Friendswood, Texas. If you're in the Friendswood area, we'd love to meet you. We have Sunday morning services at 9 and 11 a.m. and every Wednesday at 7 p.m. If you have questions about what you heard today, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to call us at 281-648-5800. Again, that number is 281-648-5800. Thanks so much for listening. We're so happy that you spent time with us today. Join us again next time as Pastor Ron has more to teach from the Gospel of John right here on Larger Than Life.